Hi, everybody. How are you? So we're going to start in a second. Um, as you can see, uh, Dean Rapper is not here tonight. He is off this week, but don't worry. We still have, obviously, our fabulous speaker tonight, Jerry, as well as um, some of you haven't met yet, Cheryl Jarvis. She's our new department chair for marketing. So if you are an MBA in marketing concentration, you probably will be having her in the future as a professor. So if you want to chat with her, she'll be here all night. Um, but just to go over stuff really quick, as I mentioned, the summary for um, Jerry's due this Sunday at noon on Canvas. And then if you have your feedback comments, you can do them starting on Sunday, or you can have them, they're due Tuesday at midnight. Just make sure if you're having problems with Canvas, you contact me or the dean, so you guys don't get points taken off. And we'll start pretty much right now, if everyone's ready, so. Woo. Perfect. Good evening, everyone. It is my very great pleasure to introduce our wonderful guest speaker tonight. Uh, truly, I think one of the best marketing minds out there right now. Uh, Ms. Jerry DeBard has more than 30 years of extensive marketing and leadership experience at very large global brands. And as of last week, I think, it was uh, announced she was named the Executive Vice President and Chief Marketing Officer for Office Depot. Jerry Smith, who's the new CEO of Office Depot, stated that Jerry has tremendous insight and experience leading global marketing efforts for world-class consumer brands with a proven record of delivering business results while acting as a change agent. She's particularly adept at leveraging digital marketing, branding, advertising, and consumer insight research to drive top and bottom line growth. She's known for building, motivating, and leading inspiring, and inspiring great teams. Uh, she has been the principal of her own marketing group, DeVard Marketing Group. She served as Senior Vice President, Chief Marketing Officer of the ABT Corporation. She served as Executive Vice President of Marketing for Nokia. She's held senior marketing roles at Verizon, Citibank, Revlon, Harris Entertainment, the NFL's Minnesota Vikings, and the Pillsbury Company. So there is some tremendous experience in the room with us today. She also serves on the board of directors of Service Master, Under Armour, and Cars.com, and has in the past served on boards including Belt, Gerwich Products, Tommy Hilfiger, and on the advisory board of Pepsi. Uh, she is an economics graduate of Spelman College, and where she also served on the board of trustees for a, a decade. And she received her MBA from Clark Atlanta University Graduate School of Business. So please help me welcome Jerry. I'm going to have to put this somewhere where you can really hear me closer. This. How's that? Okay. All right. Well, needless to say, I don't believe my own press. Um, that's kind of intimidating when you listen to all those things. And I say to myself, where did the time go? It doesn't sound like, it doesn't seem like it's been that long. So the first thing I want to know is, I'd like to know who's in the audience. Show of hands, are there any former CEOs in the audience? <laughs> any former CEOs in the audience? Oh, could you stand up and identify yourself in the back, sir? <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. Narain Gersahani. So, all right. Narain Gersahani is the former CEO of ADT and my former boss. <laughs> he is also going to be an upcoming speaker. So clearly anything that I say now will be checked by him because he knows what the truth is. Uh, I actually can say I've had the honor and privilege of working for, for Noreen for three years. Um, as you may or may not know, ADT was bought by the private equity firm Apollo. Um, and they brought in a new management team and we've all gone and done different things. But I would say that working for Noreen has certainly been a highlight of my life. So when I got the, um, well, first of all, I volunteered to be here. I, I was not, you know, Noreen was asked, I volunteered. I called up and said, can I please come and talk? Please. I'm, I'm, this is really how this happened. Because I have been where you are. I've been a student. Um, I've wanted to try and figure out where I wanted to go and what I wanted to do and not necessarily been sure of what, what that was. So I called up because I felt that maybe I could share some of my path and journey with you and they obliged and said, yes, we've got an opening on our calendar that looks to be free. We can sign you up. So that's how I got here. <clears throat> then I got a note that says, OK, if you've got a PowerPoint presentation, if you could send that in by, I don't know, well, today is Thursday. So by Tuesday, we can upload it. 
Anybody that knows me knows that I hate PowerPoint presentations. <laughs> I hate them. And I've had people, when I've set up like a meet and greet or a one-on-one -on -one to get to know a team member, that has come in with a deck to present themselves to me. And I've certainly let them go through the deck, but what I've done is said, okay, the thing that I would prefer to do is just have you come talk to me because I think that I can enjoy the story better than paying attention to the chart, slides, graphs, numbers, um, and the story of your life. I, I, I am big on stories and storytelling. So what I wanted to do in the absence of a prepared slide, and some people do that very well. Some people have great presentations, and I love them if they're good. But what I want to do is talk to you. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my journey, and then I want to be able to leave enough time for questions from you on something specific that you're interested in. I also have to tell you, too, that I am, I kind of lucked into what people would say was success, and I'll tell you why I say it's luck. And it's because I never really planned to be a senior executive. I didn't start out saying, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to eventually end up as a senior executive, and in order to do that, I have to do the following things that will lead me to that path. It wasn't organized. Did I think that I wanted to be successful? Absolutely. Did I want to enjoy what I did? Yes. And there's a correlation there, right? Because can you be successful if you don't really enjoy what you're doing? Can you? Can, can you enjoy it if you're not good at it? All right. So the first thing I said about doing was doing what I really enjoyed doing and what I thought that I could do um, better than someone else. And I can tell you the first humbling experience I had was when I came, when I started uh, college, there was a lot of money, and there still is a lot of money, and it's called STEM now, but when I was coming, you know, I was applying to colleges, it was, we just needed engineers. And so I thought, ah, I'll be an engineer. There's lots of money floating around in terms of scholarships and, and programs. I'm going to be an engineer. Are there any engineering majors back? Okay, let me <laughs> bow down. Because uh, uh, the CEO of AT is a former engineer, yes, I know. So I failed miserably at being an engineering student let alone graduate or, or engineer. The first semester, um, I, I had absolutely no attachment to the subject matter. I had absolutely no interest, and I couldn't see why it mattered. It's not like you know, kids that say, oh, why do I have to know math because I'm never going to use it. No, I just had no connection between where I saw myself and what it was teaching me. And so I just kind of checked out, and I failed at every engineering course that I had. So I had to decide what it was I was going to do. Now, I could have maybe pushed through it and said, OK, Jerry, you're smart. You'll figure this out. You get a tutor. You get a study, a buddy. But I said, this isn't it. I'm not feeling it. It's not in my bones. It's not intuitive. It's not something I'm interested in. So I had to step back and figure out what I wanted to be and what I wanted to do. Let me change that. Not what I wanted to be, what I wanted to do. And so I decided that I was going to be an econ major because I did like economics. And I knew that there was something uh, there was a quantitative side of me that I wanted to develop, not quite engineering, because I couldn't figure out where that fit in my quantitative, qualitative, creative, intuitive, you know, um, analytical side. I couldn't figure out where it fit. So I decided to be an econ major, and I loved it. I loved e econ, and I was able to come back from, you know, my mom praying on her knees every night, Lord, will my child graduate from college, please, because she saw those grades. And when that op what that opened up for me was a realm of possibilities. Because once I feel, once you have any econ majors in the room? Yeah. OK, all right, OK. Shout out to the econ majors. Uh, I thought that it gave me a great base to understand business, to understand supply and demand, and for me to be able to now have a broad range of opportunities to consider. I wasn't sure that I wanted to go to graduate school at the time. I didn't decide to pursue an MBA. So I decided to be a commodities broker. And the reason why I was a commodities broker was because I had accepted a position to be a stockbroker at Merrill Lynch in New York City. I had accepted the offer, and I was about to start. Uh, no, I, actually, I accepted it probably in March, and I was going to start in July. And there was a firm that was a big commodities brokerage house that called me and said, we see that you want to, you know, you, you're thinking about, you've accepted a position with Merrill Lynch, but do you know anything about you know, commodities? I was like, well, I know what they are, but I don't know anything about the business. And they said, well, would you come spend a day with us? Which is a very unique, I don't think people do that. You know, that's like, I know you're getting married next week you know, or in a few months, but have you, decide, have, you, have you really decided that that's who you want? Because I want you to go spend some time with this guy over here. Maybe you'll change your mind. I mean, that's really kind of what they did. 
And um, so I went, I had a great time, and I said, okay, now I have a dilemma. I've already accepted this position, and, but I don't think I want it. I think I want to be over here because I saw it as much more creative. One of the things they told me was you're not going to be in the class of 50. We're only picking eight people that we want. And now once you graduate from our program, we're going to be able to put you wherever you want to go. And then they had me meet the person I was going to work for, which I think started my interest in bonding and chemistry with who I worked for being very, very important because we just automatically clicked. So it was no more, it was, it was no longer just a job. I could see a relationship. I could see learning. I could see how I fit in to what he was trying to do. So I said, okay, I can go do what I really feel passionate about or I can honor my commitment um, to Merrill Lynch, which was a big name. And the company I went to work for was Conti Commodity. You'll never know the name of this company because they were bought out by a company that you won't know the name of, which was Revco, uh, which no longer exists. But, so I came back and I really thought long and hard about it. And I called up Merrill Lynch and I said, look, um, I've just had an opportunity that I think is phenomenal. My heart's in it. It's where I want to be. I understand the commitment I've made to you. And if you really say that, based upon what I've told you, that I don't think this is where I should be, that you want me to come, I'm going to honor it. But I don't think that that's where I should be. And they said, well, you know what? We appreciate that. We respect that. And, you know, good luck. Now, Merrill Lynch hired, I don't know, 5,000 people and some number, maybe 100. They hired a lot of people. I was not going to stop anything that was happening at Merrill Lynch. Uh, but I liked the fact that they were able to recognize the situation I was in. And I went and I became a commodities broker. And what's interesting is a commodities broker, all you get is a phone, at the time, I got a phone and a stack of leads of people that had said that they wanted to open an account. I don't know if, how many people have seen Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. You should see it. It's a good movie. Uh, but that's all I had. And so what I had to do was call up people and ask them to send me at the time to open an account was $5,000. Send me $5,000, open up a brokerage account, and we're going to make money. Now, what you don't say is that we're going to lose some money, too, right? Because when you speculate on the commodities market, you win some, you lose some. It's like the stock market, you know, some win, some lose. And so, you know, that, and at the time when I did that, I was 22 years old. So you can imagine, I've got a deep voice. Maybe I sound commanding, I don't know, but... You know, calling up somebody, cold calling them and saying, you've demonstrated an interest, I'd like you to send me $5,000. Sometimes I got it and sometimes I didn't. So what I had to do was I had to change my strategy. I had to say, look, don't send me any money. We're going to do some phantom trades. Assume that you gave me $5,000. Here's what we're going to buy. And I'm going to call you next week and we're going to figure out how much money you made. Right? So people would say, okay, good. And so for those people that made money on the trades that I suggested, I called them. People that lost money, I didn't call them. <laughs> I, I knew what the answer to that was going to be. And what I said when I called them is I said, okay, you made money this week. I'm going to give you some more ideas because I want you to be sure about this. And so for those people that made money, I called them. But for people that didn't make money, that made money the first time, I called them too. Because I said, this is what it's going to be like. And what you have to do is understand your appetite for risk. And those were the people that I ended up being successful in opening accounts and trading for them. But I also realized at the time, the markets opened um, at 8.30 and closed at 2. And I had all afternoon to do something. And I was really bored. I was supposed to be prospecting for new, new uh, clients and customers. But uh, I had a lot of time on my hands. And I said, you know what? I'm going to go back to school and learn something. I'm going to go and take a class, a graduate class in marketing. Um, not necessarily to pursue an MBA, but to fill up some time. And I absolutely fell in love with a class called Consumer Behavior, which was the first time I really understood about connecting the dots between, you know, how do you convince someone that this is the best that it could possibly be for them and how you make money at it. And I love that. And then they had a group come in from Colgate Palmolive in New York, and they gave us a case study. And we worked through one of the problems that they were having with one of the brands that uh, was struggling. And, you know, our team won that. And I thought, ah. This is what I need to do. I'm going to get an MBA in marketing. And what I also learned was I could not get that MBA by myself. Because much like I struggled in engineering, there was this course called statistics <laughs> that stood between me and the promised land. And as hard as I studied by myself, I was not going to make it. And so I recognized the importance of reaching out for help. Now, that's a, a lesson you say, of course, as a student, of course. No one's, hopefully no one here is studying by themselves and not reaching out. 
But, but there are lots of people in the workplace that struggle mightily by themselves and don't reach out and ask for help because they feel, oh, well, they've hired me. I've got to have all the answers. Or I can't show someone that I don't know what I need to do. And so they sit there and they try and figure it out. But I, Henry Screen, I'll never forget him. Henry Screen, he was a, he was a statistics whiz and he broke things down like I'd never even considered. And he got me through statistics and he got me through my MBA. And I thank him to this day uh, because I'm not, I wouldn't have been able to find that path on my own. And the first job that I took was I decided that I wanted to go into packaged goods and I went to work for the Pillsbury Company, which was, is now owned by General Mills. And uh, I spent uh, 11 years at Pillsbury. And I always say that everything that I know about marketing, I learned not in school, but at Pillsbury, because I made a lot of mistakes. I had to work with people. I had to own up. I had to show how I was going to recover from that. And here's one of the big things that I learned. The worst thing that you can do is see a problem and not raise it. It's kind of like if you, say something, see, if you see something, say something. Because I thought that what I was supposed to do was, oh my god, if this is happening, then I've got to figure it out. First thing I had to do was learn how to stay up in class because I was used, I mean, at work, because I was used to classes that were an hour or two. And then I would sit in meetings from like 8 to 5. And like at about 9, I'd find myself you know, asleep because it was like focused attention. And not only was it focused attention, but then someone would, someone would turn and say, well, Jerry, you're new. What do you think? And it would be like, OK, what do I think? And I'd say, I'm sorry, I missed the last part of what you said. Could you repeat it? Now, you know that went over really well. right? People really like that. And you, you don't have a lot of opportunities to make a second impression. So people thought, OK, well, is she really ready? Is she committed? She's fallen asleep. Does she care? I want to say, but I don't drink coffee. And this is new to me. And, but I had to recover. I had to recover. So I had to decide now, how do I want to show up so that people understand that I'm committed, that I'm smart, that I know what I'm doing, and that I'm the right person for the job? So that really involved understanding what it is you did really, really well better than anyone else and speaking out about it. So the worst thing I think that you can do is be in a meeting, be in a classroom even, and not speak up. How do I know what's on your mind? Why are you there? In class, you've got to be there to get the understanding. But when you're working, and many of you are, you have to be able to demonstrate why you're there. So you have to find out what you do better than anyone else, what you're good at and then be able to bring that to the organization, the people that you're working with. And so, uh, needless to say, I've worked there a long time and I enjoyed it. But here's one of the first challenges that I had. I worked on new products. And at that time, what you would do is you'd send out samples to everyone and you'd get feedback from them. Well, we sent out the wrong samples, got the wrong feedback, couldn't launch. We had this big launch plan. And we had to go back to our, at the time it was our vice president, and say, the test is going to be delayed significantly, and we're not going to be able to launch. And there were some people like, no, don't say that. Let's just try and figure out we can send it to 15 people and get there, how they feel about it versus the 1,500 that we were supposed to. Uh, and that would not have gone over well, not, not just from an integrity standpoint, but just from the quality of the learning that you would have had. And I remember going up and saying, you know what? We screwed up, and here's what happened. That's called jumping in the fire to avoid getting pushed. Right? If you raise your hand and say, I screwed up, then everyone's like, oh, but you know, it wasn't that bad. I mean, you really go in hard on all the things that you did wrong. But you're also saying, but, but here's what we're going to do to fix it. So I always say that in companies and in situations, there's, there are a lot of people that are crap detectors. They can tell you all that's wrong, right? Spend a whole day talking about what's wrong. But when it comes down to fixing it or what we should do about it, that's when the problems happen. That's when the crickets um, you, you hear. So I went in and said, this is what the problem is. It's delayed. We sent out the wrong samples. We're not going to be able to launch, but this is what we're going to do, and this is how we're going to recover. And obviously, that was appreciated. But I think that if I look back on my career at Pillsbury, I think what I learned was the value of education and the value of intelligence and the value of confidence, but the value of humility. The humility to know when you're wrong, the humility to seek help, and the the questioning of what you think is right amongst you, within yourself. So let, let me tell you what I mean by that. Some people look for data to prove that they're right. I think you should look for data to prove that you're wrong. I think that you should be confident enough to know that there is something wrong with what you're doing. You just want people to find it. 
So it's something that, that I used to do uh, early in my career that I've just started doing again. It was called negative challenge. I would prepare a recommendation, and I would send it out to people and say, tell me what's wrong. Find the holes in it. What haven't I thought about? And that prepared me. If I couldn't overcome those objections, then we weren't ready. So I've started doing that again, and it's wonderful. First, because people see, oh, she sees that I have value. There's something that I can add. And two, I'm part of the solution as well. I've got some skin in the game. So I have found that to be very valuable in asking for help. The other thing that I learned is that there is nothing like building relationships that are authentic. So there are all kinds of relationships, right? If you report to me, that's a relationship. You, you have to kind of do what I say. Um, if, if you don't, it's something called insubordination. And maybe I could retaliate. I don't know, maybe give you a bad review because you don't do what I say to do. And not at a dictatorial standpoint, but because I'm your boss. But then there are those authentic relationships where you follow someone because you really do believe in the vision. You believe in them. You believe in the mission. You believe that you can help. And that's a partnership that's really, really solid. I ask people this all the time um, in mentoring circles and even when I join the organization. I said, what, what is it that you'd like to do? And if someone says, um, I'd like to be promoted. Now, these are people that work for me. I'd like to be promoted. I say, OK. I said, what would your boss say? Would your boss support that? Would the organization or other people around you say that you're ready? And most people don't think about that because you can't promote yourself. You can't. You can't just say, I'm ready. And someone says, OK, good. Glad you told me that. We weren't thinking about that. But since you told us now, OK, we'll, we'll promote you. No, what happens is there's something called 360 feedback. They go and they ask questions like, well, what's your name? Jarrell. Jarrell, OK. Jarrell. Do you know Jarrell? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm or, or what? Johnny. Johnny. Oh, Johnny. You said your name was Johnny? Johnny. Johnny. OK. Johnny. You know Johnny? Oh, yeah, I know Johnny. OK, well, what do you think about Johnny? Johnny's great. Johnny has done everything we've asked him to do and more. Uh, Johnny's always on time. I can depend on Johnny. Uh, I think he's a good guy. OK, should Johnny be promoted? Yeah, I think Johnny should be promoted. OK, good. You, you didn't think he might get promoted? OK. <laughs> but that conversation can go a different way. It can be like, oh, Johnny. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Really, why? What time? Oh, well, you know, I worked on a presentation with Johnny, and he didn't do so well. And not only that, I talked to, what's your name? Ricardo. Ricardo. And Ricardo never thought that Johnny was on top of his game. I don't know what happened, but. And so me now, as I'm trying to get feedback, I've, you've already poisoned the well. Now I'm looking for stuff that's, oh, Johnny may be problematic. I only see one side of Johnny, but I want to get a cross view of Johnny. So always know that your reputation is there. You have to know what that reputation is. You have to ask. You can't just think. And, and here's, here's the other thing that happens in, in companies I'm speaking of now, is that you, your boss may have given you an outstanding rating. And let's assume the rating is 1 to 5. You've got a 5. You're outstanding. And you walk around saying, I'm a 5. I am outstanding. And then you get in a room and people say, OK, Ricardo's a five. We've got this big challenge. We want to put Ricardo on it. And then people weigh in and they go, well, he may be a five, but and then it starts. Now, if Ricardo knew what the challenges were, he could address them. If he knew that he had an issue with maybe delivering what was expected, then he could manage that. If Ricardo knew that people felt that he needed more seasoning in a particular area, that he'd only been in the job for a year, and they felt you needed two years because there were experiences. So you have to know. And the only way to know is to ask for that feedback. It's very hard. But you, I asked today. I have, I've been at my job all of five days. I, asked, I just had a long meeting, and I asked people individually. So give me some feedback. And don't tell me what I want to hear. Don't tell me, oh, it was great, it was wonderful. I said, I'm, I'm going to assume that it was great, wonderful. Tell me what wasn't good. So let's just take that off the table. Tell me what I can do better. I'm always looking for that, because you always have to. And, and by the way, everyone has a different yardstick. right? So, but you don't, you, you don't become a pleaser. You have to stand your ground. You have to make the tough decisions. But you always want to check in and see how that's, how that's doing. And I learned that at Pillsbury. I left Pillsbury, and I went to work for the Minnesota Vikings, which they call a football club. And it's called a club because it acts like a club. There are people there that started out washing the owner's car, 
our rabid football fans could recite every statistic of every player known to man, goes to every game, has a wardrobe of every kind of logoed item from the, from the, uh, the team, big fans of the purple people eaters, all of that stuff. But that's not why I joined. I joined because they had a business that relied on their win-loss record, and they wanted to change that. They felt that if we just won more games, we'd have more people in the stands. Right? If we just could get better players, we'd win more games, more people would come. That's just not true. Now, you may think intuitively it's true, but I had a great example down the road. There was something called the Minnesota Timberwolves, and they were a franchise team. They packed the house every game. Win-loss record was 0-10. Not winning any game, and I'm not exaggerating, not winning any games, but when you went to the game, boy, was it exciting. It was very exciting. And they created an experience that had nothing to do with whether or not the team won or lost. Yeah, there were some disappointed fans, but they wanted to be in that experience. So what we had to do was create an experience where people wanted to come, not just feel good about winning the game, but feel good about supporting the team. And so we did things, and what you have to think about, and what what you have to add value is you, have, you almost have to say, what can I do that's different that others aren't thinking of? Because everyone else was on that same statement about, yeah, we have to win games. But what we did was we started doing things. We had practice. <coughs> practice, the team practices. It doesn't cost you anything. Inviting people in to watch practice. People like that. It's bragging rights. I'm going to see my team practice. It didn't cost us anything. And they could take pictures with the players afterwards. Had to go talk to the coach. Dennis Green was the coach at the time. But the, Dennis saw marketing as making money for him. He's like, yeah, bring it up. You think it's going to make us some money? And it, and it, and it does. We did things like the, uh, the NFL, they charter a plane. The plane's 300 seats. The team and the administration takes me about 100, 150. You got all those empty seats. You're paying the same thing once the flight takes off. We started inviting people whose contracts were about to expire that were renting suites. Right? So you say, come and, oh, bring someone. You can bring your kid, you can bring a partner, it can be a client, because we wanted them to have bragging rights once they went back. And of course, that made them feel closer to us. It was building an authentic relationship. It wasn't a transaction. It wasn't just about renewing your contract. It was about building a relationship. Because that's one of the things you have to learn. What's the, what's the difference between a transaction and a relationship? A transaction is one time. Hopefully, you'll get it again. But a relationship lasts. And what you want to do is build relationships. And so building that opportunity within what was existing, because here's one of the things that marketing people get pinged with all the time, is that here comes the marketing person, they want some more money. I see you smiling back there, Noreen. Here comes the marketing person, they need some more money. But sometimes what happens is that you don't need more money. What you need to do is be more effective. So you have to be more effective at the dollars that you have. Do you have a question? Can you bounce around a lot of different industries uh, in your career? And I'm not even done. Yes. Uh -huh. Did you ever have issues stepping into a new job and getting pushed back because people didn't think you knew the industry and didn't know you were mm -hmm. So did everyone hear his question? Oh, good. OK. So I bounced around, oh yeah, bounced around, okay, bounced around a lot, different industries that ever get pushed back. Yes, that was the question. Not because you don't know the industry, because most times as a marketer, people want someone from the outside. They want you to bring the experience. Because we have a lot of people in the company that know the industry. And sometimes that holds you back. It's the comfort zone. I always say if, if you're a trapeze artist, you have to be comfortable letting go of that bar and reaching for another one. And some people hold on for dear life to that bar because they don't know what happens in the void of letting go. So I've been fortunate enough to be brought in as a change agent. Most people that have hired me are interested in a different perspective and not doing it the same way all the time. The other thing, too, is that because I've been in so many different industries, it's very hard to pigeonhole me. I'm not a finance person. I'm not a telco person. I'm not a cosmetics person. I have done lots of things in different industries, but the thread through all of that is that what I've been charged with doing is building demand, building desire, and building revenue. And when you've seen that done in different industries, you can approach an issue or a problem or a challenge with a much broader set of skills and experiences, successes and failures. So, but my, what I was going to say was when I left, when I left the, the Vikings, 
it was because there was, it was a short runway. I'd done so many things, and I, I loved the interaction. And it was, there was a lot of low-hanging fruit. When you go into organizations, a lot of times, you have to, you have to see what the low-hanging fruit is that no one's thinking about. Uh, there's some easy wins that you can do, but there are also some hard ones that you have to tackle. And you have to demonstrate that you are the right person to tackle them. But I left, um, I left the NFL and I went to work for uh, Revlon. You talk about complete opposite. You're like all this testosterone, you know, with football and alpha male and grunting and sweating. And then you go over here to Revlon, which is lipstick and nail polish and blush and all that. And so the pivot that you had to do was to move from, okay, how do I build, just move from building desire for a service, a, an experience, to products. Now I grew up kind of in the product house, so the four Ps were very good and very kind of instinct, instinctual to me. But moving from a category that I felt was high involvement, because I didn't, you know, I was not a rabbit sports fan. I really saw the business side of that. I didn't see the the kind of the side of people that are rabid, passionate uh, football fans. And that was good because I could step back from the win-loss record and figure out how we made money. But on the Revlon side, what was interesting about that is most cosmetics, and nobody believes this because if I asked every person in here what brands they purchased, they would say that theirs was the best. But it's a commodity. If you're buying lipstick, everybody's got lipstick. But nobody buys the same brand of lipstick. People buy the brand that they think speaks to them. And the beauty is, beauty for me is why? Why does that brand speak to you and not the other one? Is it price? Is it packaging? Is it, you know, um, recommendations from friends? Is it location? There's so many things that make up the reasons. And what we had to do was step back and say, all right, so I'm selling something that you could buy anywhere. And it's this thing called mass, mass and prestige, right? I can walk in and even Marcus and buy, or I can go to CVS. And customers say, some people go across and some people stay in one bucket. But what we had to do was to say, why do you buy Revlon? What was it about the Revlon brand that made you buy that versus something else? And at the time, the answer was technology, because this goes way back, but Cindy Crawford was the spokesmodel, and we created this transfer-resistant product. So when you put on lipstick or blush, it wouldn't rub off. She had a white blouse, and she would kiss it, and her lipstick didn't come off. That was revolutionary, because no one had done it. But what you had to do was tell people what the benefits of that were. And it sold itself. And the interesting thing was that when we started proliferating, when we started taking that transfer resistance from lipstick to eyeshadow to makeup to nails, that was a whole category. But you had to rely on technology. A lot of people thought at the time that makeup and selling makeup was smoke and mirrors. Put this on and look beautiful, 10 years younger, you know, attract attention, whatever. That was the smoke and mirrors. The underlying reason why is what you have to really dig for. What is the reason? Here's the two, here's the, the two things that make you a successful marketer. It's only two. You have to have the answers to these two questions. You ready? Everybody ready for these two? OK. The first one is, what are you selling? You have to answer that question, what are you selling? The next one is, who are you selling it to? Those are the two questions. Lots of people get tripped up around that, not knowing who their customer is. And the not knowing who your customer is is also not knowing what their needs are. Or assuming that everyone wants it, or these people want it. But not knowing what that segmentation is of loyal customers, who wants it, who's willing to buy, who's not. And more importantly, more, sometimes more important than who is buying is who's not buying. So you can understand why. And then you go, well, what are you selling? What am I actually selling? The, the story that everyone talks about, is Starbucks selling coffee? Right. So those are the two things that you have to understand, and that's what you have to bring to any situation. By the way, you could argue that if you know those two and you're still failing, then you've got to look at the four Ps. You've got to look at all the other elements around that. So moving from Revlon, I, I worked at Revlon at a time where our owner, uh, had bought lots of other brands. Um, Ron Perlman was his name, is his name. He's still very much alive and very successful. But he bought Coleman, he bought Marvel, and he started pulling a lot of money out of Revlon. And so we weren't advertising, we were getting delisted. Uh, we couldn't pay our spokesmodels, and we were just kind of declining. And I decided that I was going to go work at um, Citibank. 
So if you thought it was bad going from sweaty, you know, muscly guys to lipstick, try going to a bank and tell, tell them that you sold lipstick. Because bankers are very serious about their money. And they're like, wait a minute, you, you were selling lipstick and now you're over here talking about financial products. You've got to be kidding me. How on earth, to your question about being challenged on industry, I got a lot of eye rolls about that. But the, what was interesting was Citibank understood the power of a brand. If there's a bank that understood at the time, I think there are others now, that understood the power of the brand, it was Citibank. And Citibank wanted to be known as everyone's bank, not just the bank for the affluent, because they had higher you know, fees for minimum balance, for a check, you know, um, bouncing a check. It was really a bank for the elite, and they felt that there was an opportunity to be known as affluent, but they wanted to be more of an everyday banker. So what you wanted were skills around how do you market to a customer as a, more so than proximity. Like some people put their bank because it's on the corner, right? Like you pick out a, uh, your gym or you work out or where you get your hair done or whatever. But it's not proximity. It's got to be some other value. And the best campaign uh, that City could have done, I think, even now, and not because I was associated with it, but because it talked to me about what, why you really want to save money, is to live richly. It wasn't to be rich. The campaign was live richly. And that was for whatever you decided was a rich life. It was a vacation once every two years, every year, three years. It was you know going out to dinner once a month. Whatever that was, it was about living richly and how could, how could City help you? And then we got greedy and wanted everybody's wallet. We wanted your mortgage, we wanted your credit card, we wanted your banking relationship, we wanted your private banking. And so we set up these strategies that we were going to have everyone share wallet for everything. But that's not how it works because people choose a provider based upon the specific benefits that you're going to give me. And when you try to be all things to all people, you end up being not clear on what you focus on. And it was very hard to compete with some of the deals that were being done. So we stepped back and said, okay, if we can't be all things to all people, we've got to be the best within what we're offering. And it was also the first time that I had had a truly global experience. City bankers are all over the world. And the worst thing you could do is assume that the people sitting in the room here at Boca were the same people and had the same needs of people sitting in Norway or Berlin or, South, or, or Cape Town. You had to really step back and be hyper-local, which is what we talk about now. But you had to understand what the needs of that business were and also how they made money because it wasn't always the same. So it broadened my perspective around how did you solve a problem. It also made me much more inquisitive. You, always have, you have to have an insatiable appetite for questions. You can, can never, ever think that your learning has stopped. It continues, and it continues exponentially the greater the challenge. And so, but what was great about City was um, I learned that when you're in a highly regulated industry, there are lots of things that you'd like to do that you're just not going to be able to do, right? So what you have to do is understand how you play by real rules because there were serious consequences, serious consequences for saying the wrong thing, for mailing the wrong piece of information, for offering the wrong rate. And that was also at a time where you had to have continuity across the web, across the store, which I call the, the retail financial centers, but I call them stores because we were selling and I wanted it to be a retail experience. But you had to have continuity. So how were you going to differentiate yourself from Wells or Chase? And you really had to think about that. And that's when also technology came into play. I mean, City is credited for creating the first ATM, but they couldn't rest on their laurels. They had to do more. And, and I would say that, in some ways, Chase has out-innovated um, out uh, City in a lot of ways. Because at the end of the day, you have to have branch locations, and you also have, tech, have to have technology that is ahead of the game. And I think that Chase has done that well. And so when um, you work at Chase? No. OK. <laughs> City? My name's Kevin. Hi, Kevin. Um, yeah, I think the, my top one would be Starbucks. I think that Starbucks is amazing, and I, I do think they sprinkle a little crack in every cup of coffee. <laughs> uh, 
just a little, not to make you twitch, but to make you come back. Um, and and I, I, I also like their social responsibility as well as their social media. I mean, they really have an understanding of what they're selling and who they're selling it to, and they never rest on that. And I think that that's strong. I also, um, you know, I happen to be on the board, but I think it's a great brand is Under Armour. And I, think, and I think of Under Armour taking on Nike, the big BMF, and uh, is that for Nike or Under Armour? No, Under Armour. Oh, Under Armour. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, because, you know, Kevin Plank, the CEO, had an idea in his, you know, grandmother's home to make a better performing t-shirt that when it was wet didn't weigh five pounds, it weighed, you know, half an ounce, and that, you know, it, 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 it fit you so that it would be up under your regular uniform and you wouldn't have to kind of take it off. He was really trying to solve a problem. And once he did that, people took to it. But they've got a lot of hustle and grit in their marketing. And I love that. Um, I used to think that Pepsi was a brand that I enjoyed because here was a company, and I say Pepsi Co, because they had Frito-Lay, they had Aquafina, they had Brand Pepsi, Doritos, all of that. And there was a time when they had a lot of swagger in the market. But I think that because of the growth of water and alternatives, that it's kind of stepped off of its game a bit. So, you know, when you think about how do you stay relevant and how do you reinvent yourself, you got to put Apple up there. You get, and it's many people that want to say, you know, yeah, we've heard it all. I mean, I'm sorry. They are... They are powerhouses. And if you're going to put Apple up there, you know, you got to give Amazon credit for what they've been able to do. And so the world is shifting and pivoting, and what you used to do doesn't work. If you're doing the same thing you did last year, this year, you're, you're already obsolete. Do you think Pepsi kind of almost lost it to Coca-Cola because of the fact that Coca-Cola they were like mobilized? You know, I don't think they lost it to Coca-Cola because they've been in battle with Coca-Cola for a long time, and a lot of people feel that Coca-Cola has lost some of its it's grit. And it's because what you, you can't continue to fight just with your competitor. You have to now fight a whole bunch of people that are nipping at your heels. And they've got a business that is Frito-Lay, that they're trying to make sure the margins are good, the quality is good, and you've got this pe the people that are interested in, you know, that's all bad. You can't have it, so how do you stay healthy but still build a business? And then you've got this beverages business. And people are saying it's too much sugar, and I don't... You know. So there are a lot of things that you have to deal with. Um, and and I think that sometimes when you focus on a limited amount of products, you can be much more nimble and focused. So. Now, what's my industry? Marketing. Marketing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, here's, here's the statistic about chief marketing offers that I'll tell you. They say the average chief marketer, marketing officer lasts 18 months. It is the highest turnover of any job in the C-suite, right? So if you're those of you who are looking for a marketing job, you got to be tough and be recognized. You have to recognize what you're up against. And that's because at the end of the day, a marketer is responsible, responsible for building desire for building consideration and sales. And people feel that if you can't do it, I'm sure there's someone else that can. So with that being said, do you go in with a short-term? No. no, I never go in with a short-term perspective. I always go in saying, this is going to be my last job. <laughs> this is going to be my last job. I love the company. I love the leader. I love the products. I love my team. And then something happens. I thought that ADT would be my last job. Love the company. Love my boss. Love the team. Love Boca. I thought that would be my last job. But Apollo came along, and it was a great deal for our shareholders. So you have to roll with the punches. But you also have to, and, and I also don't walk around with that. I'm not intimidated by that. So I don't go and say, oh, my god, I can't make any decisions. I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm never at a company to make friends. Usually if I'm coming in, I'm there to make a difference, to change things. If you can make friends along the way, that's great, because I'm not going to be successful. But I'm not there to please everyone. There's going to be some disruption that's happening because I'm coming in from the outside. And so what you call bouncing around, people look at and they say, great, she's had experience at Verizon and Citibank and Pillsbury and ADT and Nokia. So they look at that as a positive. I've been able to explain when people ask me why the experiences that I've had thread through what their needs are. That's what you've got to do. You've got to say, why is my background important for what your needs are? 
So I'm going to finish one last point, and then I'm going to open up to questions. I think that when leaving um, City and then going to Verizon and then from Verizon to Nokia in London, living in London and Helsinki, and then coming from London to Boca Raton uh, to work for ADT and then ADT to work for Office Depot, I always feel that everything I've done has led me exactly to where I'm supposed to be. Now, I've always had a piece about that. You have to believe that in the midst of the, your chaotic life, that it's leading you towards something. And you have to take all of that craziness. And you know, sometimes it's a gift when you don't get what you want. Right? You have to step back and see why that is. But I always believe that when something has happened, I'm, I'm, I'm being taught a lesson. So today, you know, one weekend to Office Depot, I am thrilled. I am thrilled about the opportunity. The company I work for, a great guy. I think that we have a lot of challenges in terms of how do we make the reason that you come to Office Depot bigger and better than it is today. How do we innovate? How do we stay out ahead of our competition? And I'm really pleased that I'm at the center, I'm, that I have a seat at the table to solve those because I think that I can help. So I open it up to questions. I have one question. Earlier, <coughs> perception. So from a management perspective, how do you think about the way you see them? Or how, how does that? Can an employee change the way you see now, you being the manager, uh -huh. I guess, you know, you, you said, like, uh, if, if the employees were talking like that. Oh, I see. Can you change? It depends upon how bad the reputation is. Sometimes there are fatal mistakes that you make that you can't come back from, and there's some that you, it's a learning experience. So you have to determine whether or not, you know, if you're, if you're working at the bank and, you can, and they say you can't count, you probably should go someplace else, right? <laughs> that's, that's fatal, okay? Um, if you're working in a service business and you don't like dealing with the public and people say you're not service oriented, you probably should go someplace else. But if it's that, you know, you were given a couple of things and they weren't done well and you can understand, okay, that was because of experience or learning, then I can do better. Because you have a lot of shots. It's, that you're never, it's never just one or two. You have a lot of opportunities to prove that you can overcome what's a negative, but at a certain point you can't. And then you have to decide what you're going to do about it. But you first have to get the information. Soft skills uh, change from different corporate cultures, from Vikings to Revlon to Citibank. And I'm sure that there were different types of cultures from all those countries. How did you manage with those changes? Um, and probably you could talk a little bit about In company culture? In the company culture, mm -hmm. proving yourself, being mm -hmm. a teacher on the block, and also being a black woman. Mm -hmm. What experiences can you share about that and how you overcame that? Well, wow, that's, that's good. Well, first, first of all, one of the things that I realized I had to do was I had to show up at the interview the same way I was going to show up at work. And that's not just in dress, but in attitude and questions that I asked, because I wanted people to know what they were getting. It's like if you hired Jerry, you knew what you were getting, right? So that was important. How I navigated, some, some places I navigated it very well, and some places I didn't navigate it well. And I had to go and then ask people, OK, what am I doing wrong? What, what did I miss? I'll, I'll give you a, a great example, and, and Noreen can speak to this. I think when I first joined ADT, I was all about the mission, what we're going to do, how we're going to make it better. But I had a peer group that wasn't necessarily sure that I was going in the right direction. And I was like, I'm going to prove to them that, that's, that I'm doing the right thing. And what I should have done was stop and say, wait a minute. OK, Ricardo, I know you've got an issue. Let's talk. What is it that, you know, that I'm not doing or you feel that we can do better? And the thing about being an African-American woman, which is interesting, is I always tell people that you may not have liked me because I was a woman or because I was black, but you know I have such a forceful personality that that could be the result, too. So I couldn't separate out what you were coming at me for. And then I also, one of the things that's important is I took responsibility. I didn't say that's your problem if we don't have a good relationship or you don't trust me or you don't have confidence in my ability. That became my problem and my issue to deal with and my opportunity to change people's perspectives if they weren't the ones that I thought that they should have. I I'm going to ask someone in the back. I keep favoring the front. Is there something in the back? Yes, and tell me your name. Um, 
I, well, I would say it in a different way. But you know, every company doesn't put the the customer at the center of the equation, right? So I've worked at companies that were not consumer centric, were not customer focused. But typically, that's why they hired me. And so what we would do as a marketing organization is now talk about the importance of the customer and looking at things like brand health and making sure that people recognize that if you wanted to really change, that you had to be able to satisfy customer demands and looking at net promoter score, you know, looking at customer satisfaction and bringing all those things to the forefront. Because if there's a naysayer, you have to give them evidence as to why they should change and not just say we ought to, but here's the benefit. So yes, I've worked at lots of companies, and you think everybody is you know, consumer-centric or customer-centric, but many of them aren't. And so what you have to do is just like overload them with data that shows how they're missing the boat. Yes, tell me your name. Heather. I have so many mentors, they could fill this room. And I, I mean that literally, because I, you can't get everything that you need from one person. I mean, I, maybe you could, but I think that that's a limitation and you have to know who to go to to ask that question. So I've, I've, um, I've made it a point to build my kitchen cabinet uh, with people from different walks of life, different industries, different states in life, different locations. And that's really been good. And I always, I, I'm always saying, how should I? What should I? This is what I think. Yes. Do you have and what's your name? Andrea. Andrea. What's your, do you have a plan for Aquam Depot? Or how are you going to turn things around? So I've been there, this is my fifth day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I would be afraid if they thought that I had a plan. I have some ideas. I have some real strong hypothesis about what we can do. Uh, but I'm, for the first 30 days, I'm not gonna make any decisions. I'm listening to people. I want them to tell me what they think we should be doing and how we should be doing it. And then after about 60 days, I'm gonna come back with a plan and a recommendation based upon what I've heard. Because what you don't wanna do is be your own echo chamber um, and not be able to take in the input from others. Because just when you think you've figured it out, you'll hear some other piece of the puzzle that changes how you feel. But you do have to very quickly come in with a vision. Now, I've given um, ideas about what's important to me uh, and the magnitude of the challenges that we have to satisfy. But no, I, ha I have not come in with a plan. Yes? So during your career, you basically sold everything to everyone across the planet. <laughs> Well, I think that that's a good question because companies get so many resumes that go into the circular file. <laughs> and, and so if you're talking, about, if you want your resume to get noticed, I think LinkedIn is an amazing tool. And, and please don't everybody hit me up for an acceptance to LinkedIn. <laughs> but that being said, um, I think that trying to get noticed is a function of how much hustle you have and how far you're gonna go to find people that know people that know people that can influence what you wanna do. That's just an aside. But on your resume, I think that what you have to do is pull forward very quickly what your true strengths are that you want, that the company needs. So some people have a generic resume that they put up, but I think it's very important if you're applying to a specific company to read their latest earnings, to understand what their challenges are, to look at how the, comp how, how the competition is faring, and be able to say, Here's a, this, here, here are the skill sets that I think you need, and here's how I can help you in a cover letter, um, and, and then be able to get it to the right person. But your resume can't just go on and on. And I also like action words, not that you manage, but put numbers in there. Drove a 5% increase in, was able to create X. I mean, give solid examples with metrics around how you made a difference, other than just showing up for work every day. Trying to be, uh, where did I go last? I was here last, so I'm going to go here. Thank you. I'm Douglas. Uh, my question is kind of piggybacking off of that. If, when you finish your MBA in a different uh, career and then you went into marketing, do you have suggestions for were you uh, initially hired in a management position or if you weren't, what was your role to get into the management mm -hmm. of the market? Right. 
Well, with an MBA, I was, I was hired into a management position, and I think that, uh, you know, it allowed me to then take a path. And I also went into packaged goods where it was, you know, you started as a marketing assistant, then an assistant, and associated brand manager, so it was, it was a path that was given. If you're not in management and you want to be in management, the first thing you have to do is you have to state that that's what you want. And then you have to find sponsors that agree, that say, yes, I think you can do it. Here's what you need um, in terms of timing, in terms of exposure, experience, or no. I don't think you could do it, and then you want them to tell you why, and then most likely you need to find a company that believes that you can, because you don't want someone to dictate what you're going to be. You want to dictate that and find someone that believes it. Yes? Um, Sean, uh, it's kind of a two-part question, so I'm going to try to condense Oh, two-part questions, questions. okay. So, um, uh, being that, I guess, you're entering into your professional journey at a very early point in your career, uh, uh, maybe you didn't receive the signal until later, but uh, was there, I guess, a time where a lot of times that people kind of underestimated you as far as uh, age or as far as try to uh, maybe uh, stigmatize you in your ideas, especially if you're trying to implement some type of change in the way things are going currently? Of course. I can't tell you how many times I walked into a room with someone that worked for me who was a white male and people started talking to them, assuming that I couldn't have been the person in charge. Of course there were people that felt that I got my job because I was an African American or because I was a woman. I couldn't have earned it. They were just trying to fill a quota. But you know what? You can't own that. You can't claim that. That's, that's in their minds. What you have to do is show up and perform so that people that thought that, oh, okay, I thought that, but you know what? Now she's making a little sense. I, I understand what she's doing. She's making a difference, right? Because there are people that are going to stereotype you and they're going to believe, fill in the blank. You're too young. You're too old. You know, you have experience here, and we need experience there. But once you're there, it's your job to perform. There's no, there is no substitute for being a high performer. There's just none at any level. Where do you draw the line up between uh, humility and knowing that you can do your boss's job? <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Um, if you can do your boss's job, that's great. Because if you work for a good boss, they're going to recognize that you're do, you can do their job, and you're going to say, you know what, I think that we're doing a lot of the same things. I'd like to have the opportunity to be promoted. And here's why. Here are the, here's the difference that I've made, and so you have to lay out your case. And there's nothing wrong with thinking that you can do your boss's job. I mean, that's good, right? And you don't, you don't say, I can do your job, but you say, here are the things that I've done that I think prepare me to take on additional responsibility. And you want their partnership and sponsorship of that. Yes? Uh, Jennifer, um, on your bio, so you also have the Bard Marketing Group. Yes. So was there a time in your life that you were just self-employed? Where you weren't working? There was a t when I left ADT, I was self-employed. And actually, when I left Nokia, and here's why. Because I know a lot of marketing people, a lot of CMOs. And while they won't hire a big consulting firm like Booz or Boston or McKinsey, They'll hire me. I called myself the CMO whisperer. And so they'd call me and they'd say, Jerry, I have this problem. And earlier in my career, I would just help people. But then when I left you know, my job, I said, wait a minute. No, this costs money. I've been through a lot here, and I'm going to help you. And so I just was able to monetize that in a way that, was really, that really worked with my time that I had and my interest. Do you like doing that? Like, why do you like working for a big company? Because I don't like being alone. I mean, as a consultant, it was just me, myself, and I. And while I loved, I, and I loved going to visit the client and being in their ecosystem of people and challenges. And I also, consulting work is catch and release, right? You catch a problem, you give a solution, and then you let it go. And you don't always know what happened, how it was executed, and I miss that. I wanted to be able to, to develop execute, learn from, reiterate, and, and I didn't have the opportunity to do that. I've done it, um, and I've been able to pick the people that I want to do it, but I much prefer being in the arena. I'm going to come over here. Yes? Uh, my name is Michael Provenzano. I was wondering, um, what do you feel has been your most satisfying initiative? Which, which one would you say you're most proud of? I would say that I am most proud of the Doughboy's 25th birthday. <laughs> because what I worked on a brand that was called Family Flower, which is not very exciting. It's, it's, a, it's the largest business that they <coughs> had, but it was all price driven. You, know, you drop the price, you sell more flour. Family Flower, Wheat Flour, Soft Rising, Unbleached, 
you know, all kinds of flowers, but it's a commodity. And so I, it, two years before the Doughboy was turning 25, I knew that the Doughboy was turning 25, and I said, are we doing anything about it? And everybody was focusing on their individual brand. I didn't have money to advertise. You know, when's the last time we saw a commercial for flour or an ad for flour? You just won't see it. So I wanted to create some, a, a, a platform by which we could talk about flour because flour is the center of a lot of things that are made. But I didn't have the money, so I had to go to all of my peers and have them kick in money for this idea to celebrate across the company the Doughboy's 25th birthday. We hadn't done it. We hadn't celebrated his 10th, his 15th, his 20th. Uh, and it became a really big, big uh, platform. I got promoted. I got stock. The first time I'd gotten stock. It was a really big thing, and I also recognized the power of um, having an idea and being able to sell it and have an influence. And we'll take two more questions, and then we'll be Oh, two more questions. Okay, yes. The most helpful aspect of my career that made me develop executive presence was failing. Failing and learning from the failure. It, it gives humility. It forces you to be introspective. It makes you recognize culpability. You know, no one did that to me. I had a hand in that. And it made me have to come back and recover from that. So as I said, I've learned more from my failures than any of the successes that I've had. During your introduction, what's your name? My name's Clark. Clark. During your introduction, uh, it seemed like you served as a pleasure to several board of directors mm -hmm. uh, on, on the board themselves. Can you explain a little bit about what the process was like in becoming involved with the board of directors mm -hmm. and what that's like kind of managing a CEO mm -hmm. or a CEO? Uh, sure. Um, so the boards I serve on, I um, search firms, you know, ex uh, search firms that go out and find talent for companies and boards called me and said, um, we're doing a search for a board candidate. Uh, would you be interested in talking to them or, or pursuing this opportunity? And what they do is they usually send you a, a spec around the company and, and the rest of the directors. And, and typically, they will say, we are looking to add a marketer to the boardroom, or we're looking for someone to add some perspective from some industry. And so what happens is, is once you say, yes, I'm interested, then you go into a consideration set. Some companies will recruit a director and they say, go out and find me that individual and see if they're interested. I'd like to put them on my board. But more, more so than not, they interview lots of candidates and you get in front of the board chair and the other directors and you interview. And the interview is, why should you be on our board? And so at the end of this process, and they usually start out with a long list of people and then they make it a shorter list of people. And once you've met with the, the chairman, the, the directors, and you, typically the CEO, they make a selection. And so I've served on the boards I've served on because they felt that I could do some good in the boardroom. And the job of the, the board is really to represent the interests of the shareholders and fire, hire the CEO. Yes? Um, so you've been in the marketing industry for a long time. And Within, within that time, the rise of social media has been like, really rapid. Mm -hmm. So with, how has you, like, when creating a marketing campaign, how has social media affected that with the rise of like social justice warriors on social media? Mm -hmm. And when creating a marketing strategy, does it affect your decision whether it be like negative backlash like is right away like prevalent? Like for example, the Pepsi commercial with Kendall Jenner mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. whatever Jenner it was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, you know, like, well, like the backlash was so, like right away, like uh -huh. you travel so fast, but I'm sure Pepsi thought it was a great campaign. Uh -huh. So like, does that affect you since you, when you probably started first, there was no social media, right. or like there was really no, and now it's like so big. Right, so I want to talk about two points. Yes, back in the horse and buggy days when I started, there was no social media. <laughs> <laughs> but social media has taken a much more prevalent place in the marketing mix. And at every company that I've joined since Nokia, I've typically been the one that's brought in social media because it's sometimes like a backwater, like somebody ought to manage our, our Instagram account or our Pinterest account or our Facebook, somebody ought to do that and let's get somebody in the corner that can respond to the likes or put up some generic you know, content that people can respond to, but not true engagement, not true authenticity. So uh, social media has become very important. There's some people that launch campaigns in social media. I'm not there yet. 
uh, because I think that the broad awareness reach targets, are, broad awareness vehicles are really important. But it's interesting that you mentioned Pepsi because I think Pepsi's issue was not about social media, it was about who was in the room when you thought that this was okay. And that's the case for diversity. That's the case for having other people's perspectives when you're talking about doing something. Because I think that if they had had a broader array of people, ethnicities, gender, um, age, they, somebody would have said, uh-uh, uh-uh, no, don't do that. So you have to bring the right people to the table. Yes, I know Tanya's giving me the evil eye, but. <laughs> uh, my name is Salim, and you mentioned how failure basically play, played a huge role in your learning process. Mm -hmm. so I guess my question is pretty general, but it's going to be, if there's anything at all, if you could go back in time, is there anything at all that you would have done differently? Hmm. Well, you know, I, I, part of me says no because it all led me here and I'm exactly where I want to be. But there are decisions that I looked at and said, yeah, I, I would have changed. There are probably lots of them. I, I remember um, there were people that worked for me that maybe I kept on too long because I just didn't want them to lose their job. And so I tried to coach them. And then I realized later in my career that I didn't do them any favors uh, by you know, uh, allowing them to continue to kind of flail without letting them know and trying to assist them with something that they would be better at. That's really hard. When they, the people decisions are hard, but you're hired in a managerial capacity to do what's right for the company. And so sometimes you have to let people go. So I, I probably struggled with people a little too long. Um, I think also maybe earlier in my career, I coveted my own ideas too much. I thought that my job was to prove that my idea was right and I had to win. And then you have to learn that you have to put your ideas on the table and then you have to go back and go with the will of the people the people being either the executive committee or your team or your group and say, okay, we're all in now. I may have walked in here with a totally different perspective, but I see the wisdom of the crowd and we're gonna make it work. And so sometimes I didn't move as fast on that. Uh, but the other things I would say too was, um, I remember I took on a, a business from someone that had preceded me and they put out some really lofty goals that we were going to be able to achieve. And I looked at the P&L in our plan and I said, well, I don't think we can do this, but the guy before me got promoted, so okay, we're gonna do this. And so I suited up and I went about doing it. And at the end of the year quarter, we didn't do it. And I remember starting my discussion around, well, the reason why we didn't do it was because the other guy put up this large number that we came up and they were like, whoa, whoa. You sit in that seat, it's your job to pull the covers back and say what you believe. And so when you see something that looks like it doesn't add up, it's your job to say it and not just assume you know, that if you pray and hop on one leg and throw salt over your shoulder and rub a rabbit's foot, that it's gonna happen. You have to really be able to clear that out and say what you believe the team can do, or yourself. Well, thank you very much for your time. And um, I, I, wish, I wish all of you success in what you're doing and charting your own course and recognizing that you know where you're going is only a step, a stepping stone to where you will be. So, good luck to everyone.